Coming up on Digital Music Trends 206, recorded on the 29th of October 2014, Pandora launches the AMP Artist Marketing Platform, iTunes Downloads Decline, Deezer buys Stitcher, Tidal launches in the US and the UK, and we do a quick demo, the ECJ rules on whether embedding videos can infringe copyright, the release of Taylor Swift's 1989 album, and lots more. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Leonelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and DMT is available in a wide range of streaming services, many of which enable you to subscribe to the show but if you'd like to receive a weekly mail out that lets you know when the show is out, I mean uh, it uh, sometimes varies uh, a week on week, uh, it could be a few hours later or a few hours earlier, uh, you can subscribe to the newsletter that's on bit.ly slash DMT list and you'll be the first to know when the new show is out and this week it's a real pleasure to welcome back Barbara Halama to the show so hi Barbara and thanks for joining me how's it going Hello, Andrea. Thanks for having me again. All good, all nice. It's great to have you. And Barbara has over a decade of experience in the digital music industry. Uh, she started as an <laughs> editorial chief at iTunes Germany and Austria back in 2005 and has since worked uh, uh, in a, on a freelance capacity on a variety of different projects really to do with music and technology in Germany. And so you're actually in Vienna right now at, at a conference. So what, what conference is it? Um, it is the Pioneers Festival. It is a, a, a very well known and very well done um, tech conference. Um, I've never been here. Uh, the location is amazing. I'm very looking forward to go there right after our call. Um, they have not so many music related topics, yeah. but uh, I will have some meetings with some people because music is everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and uh, you know, we also were talking about the fact that we're both going to be at uh, the Dublin Web Summit next week. Uh, and I, in a few hours, I'm going to head out to uh, BIME uh, in Bilbao, which is a great conference that's happening in Spain uh, this week. So you can go and check that out as well. I'll leave a link in the show notes. And uh, uh, this week, I want to start by talking about uh, Pandora. So Pandora uh, last week announced the launch of an analytics platform that had been long rumored called AMP. Uh, AMP uh, will enable artists to see where their music is being played. So uh, the launch of AMP, uh, of AMP is seems like uh, a major step forward for Pandora and is likely to generate a lot of goodwill uh, amongst artists who have been so far pretty skeptical of Pandora's uh, uh, sort of politics and tactics when it comes to the royalty royalty rates debate especially but we'll, a little bit more on that later on and so founder uh, Tim Westergren uh, made the announcement in a blog post where he introduced the idea by talking about his own experience uh, when he was uh, working in a band and traveling around and uh, trying to find places to play and only playing to a handful a handful of people without really knowing where he was going or where their audience was and so of course now Pandora with uh, uh, you know uh, well over 70 million uh, uh, monthly users uh, and uh, uh, you know billions of streams happening all the time it can really provide some uh, interesting granular data for bands that are touring but also for bands that are uh, planning uh, their release strategy for example for an album and they want to know where to spend their wh where their marketing budget would be better spent and so uh, the company's uh, uh, video explains as having three key functions uh, which are um, to uh, allow artists to understand uh, how fans listen uh, so from which, which devices and, and where essentially uh, the location of where the fans are listening from and what the fans are listening to obviously so uh, uh, if you are an artist you will be able to know uh, what tracks uh, uh, the fans are listening to uh, you know, what fans are uh, what tracks are getting the most uh, traction the most thumbs up and uh, sort of figure out those metrics to, to sort of uh, relate back into your uh, live experience or your marketing campaign so so uh, this is a, a, a very interesting uh, move forward. Uh, Barbara, f from your end, uh, how do you feel this uh, uh, can uh, affect uh, uh, artists? Uh, of course, uh, Pandora is not available here in Europe, uh, but as far as the US is concerned, uh, how do you feel like this, this kind of analytics can compare to something, for example, that Spotify can provide? That's really amazing because uh, uh, as far as I know, the Spotify analytics are not really great. Um, so you 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 know you have really not no idea you you know which songs are trending but you don't know where are the people uh, sitting so this these analytics are amazing but as you said we don't have pandora so i only can uh, say or or i only can argue what i read about it mm. which is a which is a pity uh, analytics is the most important thing nowadays uh, for uh, especially diy artists and um, as far as i know only bandcamp 
really uh, gives you a little bit of information about where is, are your fans. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and, and I mean, that, that seems to be uh, a key point. I mean, Pandora had been uh, talking about this uh, platform for ages, but uh, I think people were getting a little bit skeptical about its release because uh, we weren't seeing it, it uh, actually come online. But uh, I actually haven't managed to. I was, I was trying to find somebody that had already used it in the past week, but uh, I hadn't ma haven't managed to. So if you are listening to the show and have used AMP, uh, I would love to hear your thoughts. Uh, uh, as uh, as uh, uh, Barbara said, we uh, don't have access to it uh, here in the UK. Uh, I mean, we have access to AMP, but we don't have access to Pandora. Uh, uh, it, the cool thing about it is that, of course, uh, Pandora does stream uh, tracks from, uh, uh, you know, uh, 125,000 artists from all over the world. Uh, the cool thing about it is that uh, all these artists are actually going to have access to AMP. So uh, regardless of where you're from, you're going to be able to see if your music is being played on Pandora and how many times. And uh, uh, according to the stats, you also might be able to plan interesting activities around, for example, uh, doing crowdfunded gigs or trying to figure out ways to uh, reach out to your fan base uh, in order to be able to play in the United States if you haven't been able to before. So a lot of uh, different angles here uh, for the company to, uh, to explore and uh, I think we're going to see a lot of uh, a lot more uh, around this uh, over the coming weeks and uh, uh, sticking with Pandora actually uh, uh, the company announced this Q3 earnings uh, and uh, uh, that was uh, just a few days ago and it showed that it's uh, very very close to being profitable that seems to be the mantra for Pandora <laughs> they don't seem to be able to actually get there uh, you know <laughs> they are now at, uh, at a 2 million net loss uh, uh, posting record revenues of 239 million uh, so this represents a 40% increase uh, over last year's uh, figures and uh, in 2014 the company's revenues rose 49% uh, compared to 2013. So overall uh, 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 you know a good performance for for any company but uh, uh, the stock was falling unfortunately uh, because uh, investors are concerned with uh, the potential for growth uh, since uh, there has been a significant slowdown in in the growth of, 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 of users. Uh, uh, this uh, is sort of to be expected in the sense that Pandora has really reached uh, such a huge mass of listeners in the US uh, that one has to wonder how many more people can they reach and so my uh, take on it has always been that Pandora has got to figure out a way to expand internationally at some point soon and uh, uh, the company is also uh, embroiled in uh, of course the uh, debate uh, around uh, what's happening to uh, uh, rates uh, the current uh, uh, copyright royalty board uh, mandated rates uh, are the statutory uh, uh, rates are expiring in 2015 and so uh, now the negotiations are in full swing for the 2016 to 2020 rates. Uh, you know, s some interesting things happening as Pandora has proposed its own rates uh, uh, that they would like to implement. Uh, Sound Exchange has proposed uh, uh, the rates that they would like to see implemented. Of course, there's a there's a fair discrepancy between the two. Uh, Pandora has also introduced some interesting things around how. Uh, um, they would like to uh, make it so that uh, when they do a direct deal with a the label, uh, they can, you know, uh, essentially reduce the royalty rate uh, if they are pushing the label's content uh, uh, as opposed to another label's content. So th this appears to be something that they've done with the, uh, the recent Merlin deal. So there's a lot of uh, things in play here. It's, it's a very complica complex issue, and I hope I'm going to have somebody uh, come uh, on to talk about it uh, sometime in the next few weeks uh, and, and uh, uh, sort of elaborate a little bit more on that. Uh, Barbara, uh, in terms of uh, earnings uh, uh, you know do you feel like uh, you know here we're seeing a company that is doing well but it's still essentially struggling uh, sound exchange is asking for higher rates uh, uh, to be paid uh, uh, that would uh, increase the burden on pandora even more uh, pandora is asking for a reduction in rate uh, in rates uh, you know w w w how do you feel about this uh, you know do you feel that this makes sense uh, it makes sense to try and get this company to become profitable at long last uh, uh, or do you feel like uh, rights holder are, uh, right hold, rights holders are correct in asking for more money from from Pandora? Uh, it really depends on the service. So, um, it, but but I have another question first. Um, sure. How what is how do how much do they charge for the um, AMP stuff? So if you're on AMP as an, as a label. The, ah, the you actual, see, I mean this free, yeah. this actually would be a business model, no? Yeah. I mean, you know, so asking rights holder for. Um, Money is you have to in exchange to give something, and so it would be. Uh, I think I would, yeah, it's a business model. Yeah, I think you know, uh, the, the AMP for them it's sort of a goodwill gesture because they have had a lot of bad press over the last sort of two years around the fact that they were trying to lower their royalty rates. 
and so I think in that sense they they are trying to give it away for free so that it generates a little bit more goodwill uh, towards the company. Uh, but uh, yeah, but you you can't eat goodwill. <laughs> no, you can't I mean, eat goodwill. <laughs> yes, uh, that's a very good point. Uh, you know the shareholders. You know, it would be really. A uh, it would be. Do we, have you heard about this uh, new social network called Elo? Sure, yes, you have. Yes, yes. I actually and haven't tried it out. Unfortunately, I, I'm really behind on that. Really, <laughs> it's yeah. it's a really nice one. And and what I like is the business model. They don't sell ads. They don't. Uh, they will never sell uh, user data, but they will make money in the future selling widgets and uh, uh, functions. You right. know, they are taking this over from the uh, games industry, and. Uh, for Pandora, it would be also a really good uh, move to do it in. Yeah, it sounds like uh, yeah, it could, could be an interesting move for them as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think they're just worried about. I think if they try to charge for the service, there will be a huge mm -hmm. uproar at the moment because uh, I think artists already feel like Pandora is taking so much from them in terms of you know uh, not paying enough for the music uh, or them not receiving enough money uh, from uh, the millions of plays that Pandora is doing. So uh, in, in, st strategically, it makes sense at least for now uh, to do it this mm -hmm. way. I guess once the rates are decided for 2016 to 2020, then the, it might be another story. They might change their minds. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll have to wait at least Let's another <laughs> we'll have to wait another yeah, yeah. year to see that uh, and we have a, a lot of competitors uh, along the way also coming up absolutely yeah we're seeing a lot of companies come up that uh, could uh, affect Pandora's performance so uh, no, uh, Apple uh, being one of them uh, even though the uh, iTunes radio hasn't really taken off the way they wanted it to uh, uh, there are there is an interesting uh, development there uh, that we'll talk about soon uh, around Beats music and uh, so I wanted to move on to talk about uh, iTunes and uh, iTunes uh, is uh, a service that, of course, everybody's familiar with, uh, but uh, it seems like it is uh, on, on a sort of a pretty uh, fast uh, decline in terms of music downloads. Uh, uh, in, even a security filing submitted to the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission by Apple uh, highlighted the fact that uh, the company's uh, uh, business is growing in terms of the iTunes store, uh, but it is growing be because of in-app purchases rather than uh, digital music sales that are actually declining. And uh, the Wall Street Journal actually reported that uh, Apple iTunes store sales uh, may see a 13 to 14 percent decline in iTunes uh, sales uh, for 2014, uh, which uh, would be a pretty steep decline worldwide. Uh, you know, we expected that in the U.S., but I, I didn't really expect that to happen on a worldwide basis. And uh, uh, you know, of course, uh, the company is uh, rumored to be uh, working on uh, on an integration of Beats Music into the iTunes uh, service uh, sometime early next year. Uh, although uh, that could always jump. I mean, there's probably a ton of negotiations happening right now. Uh, also to uh, renew the licensing deals uh, so that uh, Apple can actually essentially incorporate Beats uh, into its own uh, into its own uh, product. Uh, Barbara, uh, you know Germany is a very special market in that sense. Uh, how uh, how is the feeling uh, there as far as uh, download sales are concerned? Uh, uh, you know, are there projections of a decline there as well, uh, uh, or and people are people switching to streaming? Um, yes, of course, they are switching to streaming, but uh, not as they are doing in America, of course. I think in, in Germany, for a normal CD, uh, the normal CD uh, uh, sales are still about uh, around 60% people buy CDs. It, it really depends on the genre, of course. Right. Uh, I'm talking about uh, top 20 stuff. And... Um, yeah, but it's it, it's really interesting, and it's of course it's no wonder that the, that the uh, sales are going down because uh, many people are using uh, streaming services. Spotify is the the biggest uh, thing over here, and also what I see here in Germany is the um, all the hardware which comes now with uh, Spotify, you know, Sonos, right. and it, it, it's it's all like. Uh, yeah, it has to be very comfortable uh, to, 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 to listen to music, you know, even if it's in a car or even if, if it's on your uh, device or uh, if you have a, a family and your kids are listening to this while you are listening in the other room to, to this. So I think this is the uh, primary focus in, in, in Germany right yeah, now. Yeah, and I guess like Germany is one of the countries where, because uh, it was a very it was a very late adopter of, of, of digital in terms of s switchover, uh, 
there is a feeling that there's sort of a, a, a skip uh, from people going from buying CDs, uh, going directly into streaming services, sort of in, in a sense uh, bypassing uh, uh, download sales uh, in a sense. So, so back when you were at iTunes, so how, how did you first start sort of to market to digital to, to in Germany, considering that even even today is such a high proportion of, of sales are on CD. But back then, it must have been probably like 90, 95, 98 percent. So, so uh, can you tell us a little bit about those those uh, first uh, first couple of years and? <laughs> And uh, how you found those? Ah, it was very interesting because you know um, the the artists they were really frightened about everything you know. But uh, 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 and also when they started, they had the uh, digital rights uh, management, the, the DRM, which is not which was not a very good idea. So they made many mistakes, and and I think some users were really pissed about this. So they stayed at the um, <laughs> sorry, they they stayed uh, at illegal platforms if it comes to digital, or they just shared it with their friends, uh, you know. Why it really took off in Germany or in Europe at all? Right. It was because of uh, it took off because of the devices, of course. You know, right. everybody wants to have the really cool iPads at this time and was wants to run around with the white ear earplugs. And yeah. <laughs> um, so I think this helped it uh, a lot. Music Load, for example, they already existed when iTunes started. They did not have uh, any hardware attached to their service. Yeah. So I think uh, without iPad, uh, i um, um, iPhones and iPods. Ipo yeah. iPods, <laughs> iPods. Uh, uh, iTunes wouldn't have taken off. So uh, once more, uh, hardware company disrupted uh, music industry, which is great. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess like I think it. It's, it's totally right what you say. The people will not uh, buy downloads. They will go uh, back to streaming. But um, I am old school. I like to have stuff. And also I don't want to have that if a streaming service is closing down, what is happening to my playlist? Exactly, you know, yeah. that, this, uh, I think this is something nobody really uh, is, is thinking about. It, I, it's something that I talked about a couple of years ago. I actually gave a little... A little uh, uh, talk about uh, this very topic about portability and sort of what's going to happen to our digital uh, cloud collection if we don't have anything that actually belongs to us because essentially the playlists that we are creating uh, belong to the service that we're creating them on so you know there's no real, real way of exporting uh, Spotify playlists unless you are an expert and you can use uh, or you know you're really into this kind of thing and you can use uh, something like Tomahawk for example uh, to uh, pull your playlists or, or sort of hack your way into your into your own playlist that uh, data <laughs> uh, and so uh, so we'll see what happens on, on that I, I'm, I'm intrigued as to how iTunes is gonna uh, push streaming uh, there have been rumors also that uh, Apple is looking at uh, slashing the cost of subscriptions uh, to uh, five dollars instead of ten um, this I think is going to be difficult uh, for the labels to accept because users are so used to the ten dollar, ten pound, ten euro price point for streaming services, and there's a whole ecosystem that has been built around that uh, from the likes of Spotify, Deezer, RDO, uh, and you name it. And, and I just don't know how labels would justify uh, accepting such a price uh, decrease, given that. Uh, you know, the entire music ecosystem will be so, sort of thrown into turmoil. I mean, just as we're seeing the revenues from, stream from streaming really increase, uh, if Apple was to slash prices, would that lead all the other services to have to follow suit? Would they be able to? Would that mean that users will switch uh, back into iTunes to, for the subscriptions? Uh, a lot of question marks there. So in terms of pricing, Barbara, you know, do, do you feel like uh, uh, Apple can swing, you know, with their, with their uh, market power? C could they swing uh, slashing the cost of subscriptions? And could that damage the, the, the ecosystem? So when I, when I first heard about it, I was like, oh my God, every, every good artist will remove their content from the streaming services. Right. But then I, I, I did a little bit of math and I talked to some people about it. And the thing is that um, if you, if you it, it's really much money, you know, 10, 10 euro or $10 or whatever a month is 120 a year. And this is even more people would, sp would have spent before on buying phys physical music. And uh, so I think if they reduce it and they will get more people on board. So it's, it's just a mass thing. And, and this should uh, uh, also, I don't know, 
for an artist, it 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 should be worth it. Yeah, I mean that that's the thing. Like uh, for, for, uh, we have seen a lot of studies that show that people would be interested in uh, more interested in a service if it was five dollars instead of ten. I mean that's kind of obvious, right? Uh, <laughs> it's it's cheaper. But uh, uh, I think uh, I mean my main question mark is how a reduction of that price would relate to services that already exist and that have built a model around the sort of ten ten dollar. Uh, 10 pound price point and are just starting to break even you know like we've seen Spotify has posted their first profits in 2013 in the UK which shows that the model is starting to work uh, mm. but if we challenge that sort of economic that, that fundamental economics around how subscriptions work uh, it's just going to be really interesting to see how everybody else adapts in the marketplace I think uh, uh, but uh, I guess we'll have to wait and see right <laughs> Yeah, but I think it's 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 really interesting, and nothing is in stone, you know. You, you, right. They can always offer uh, new models, and uh, as we have a, uh, uh, yeah, it's got, it's still very interesting. And I also for artists, uh, they have a lot of possibilities, you know. You, they can. There are ideas that they just have two songs uh, from a new album on on a streaming service for I don't know it, what is it called transaction no do you know how it is called transactional transactional all oh, right um, so you you can have two songs from the new album streamed in the first month but in the second month you can put on the whole album to the streaming service right um, so yeah, it's a windowing right you're talking about windowing, windowing. Yeah, 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 sure. yeah 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 so yeah. you you have you have uh, different uh, possibilities and i would say it's all agile you know uh, try and try out uh, make your math make your uh, metrics and then um try out something else yeah, and I mean, talking about windowing and iTunes, uh, we've seen uh, uh, Taylor Swift's uh, uh, 1989 album was released uh, just a couple of days ago, and it's already set to become the highest selling uh, release of uh, 2014. Uh, it might even break the 1 million sales mark in the US, and it would be the first album not only to break the first uh, the, the 1 million sales mark uh, uh, for uh, week one sales, but also the first album to break the 1 million mark in general in the US for this year, which is quite a feat. Uh, and ag again, uh, Taylor Swift Swift has implemented uh, windowing, so uh, the album is not available on Spotify, uh, unfortunately, or uh, any other streaming service in the US. Uh, it is, uh, a, in a strange sort of t a twist of things, it, it is uh, on a very special offer uh, on the Microsoft uh, Music Deals app. Uh, so we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Microsoft launched a Music Deals app uh, available for Windows 8 uh, uh, consumers and Windows uh, Phone consumers, uh, uh, where every week they slash the prices of uh, around 100 albums uh, and this week uh, the Taylor Swift album is available for 99 cents which is uh, uh, quite a saving considering that uh, the normal album will cost uh, over $12 uh, uh, on the iTunes store so uh, we'll see what happens with that I mean it's a limited offer and it's not being pushed very much so I doubt it's going to have the same effect as uh, uh, Gaga's uh, uh, release of uh, Born This Way which was in 2011 where Amazon uh, offered the album for 99 cents and sort of was credited with uh, 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 catapulting the album into, into the number one spot because it wasn't actually performing that well, uh, that particular release. And so, yeah, we're going to have to see what happens with that. Uh, I... <laughs> You know, obviously, Microsoft is taking a huge loss on that. Uh, do you think that people can be persuaded to, you know, 2011 was 2011 and Amazon was trying to build itself uh, its own brand when it came to music? In 2014, in the United States, are, are people going to get uh, driven to download this Microsoft Music Deals app in droves by simply an offer? Uh, what do you reckon? I'm not a big fan of all these of 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 all these uh, super cheap uh, uh, things because I mean people will buy you have you have music lovers they will buy it what no matter what it costs and then you have these people who are running into who are running in every store also physical stores oh this is cheap 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 you know in Germany we have this um, uh, it it was a it was a, a the ad. It was the ad for a big electronic uh, market. Geiz ist geil. I can't translate it right now. We'll, we can make it in the show notes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and this mentality, uh, I don't know if it is a good thing for stores or for services at all. Because you do not build sustainable customers with these things. You can have good offers, but when you see in the charts that the top 10 are only filled with 199 albums. I don't know if it's a really uh, sustainable business. I can understand in terms of Windows that they want to do it. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> and um, 
but on the other side, you know, streaming services once uh, they were the the heroes because. It, they stopped people from downloading illegal yeah. and, uh, and and but now you because i don't have a windows uh, phone and i will not uh, go to a uh, whatever so for me if i want to stream it or it, uh, i don't know it doesn't feel really right but let's let's just take it as another step try things and don't do it again <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, um, Microsoft obviously is taking a loss uh, on this, uh, like Amazon took a loss on the Gaga release. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that probably cost them several million dollars, according to the, the calculations made in 2011. Because, uh, of course, they still have to pay whole pra- uh, wholesale for the album. They wouldn't have gotten any discounts uh, uh, to make this promotion. So, uh, you know, uh, it's good for Taylor Swift, I guess, if more people buy the album. Uh, but as far as the ecosystem uh, and, and, and the fact and how people uh, perceive uh, the, the price of music, it's uh, perhaps not such a good thing. But again, uh, not such a high profile promotion, so probably not going to have uh, much of an effect uh, in this particular case. Uh, um, you know, the window is the windowing thing is, is still uh, a problem because now that streaming services are becoming more mainstream, even in the US, uh, people are going to feel the absence of certain releases more. Uh, uh, you know, perhaps in 2011 was it when Adele released her her album, and it, you know, uh, it wasn't available for streaming. Uh, you know, streaming was still a, a, an emerging trend, so people would have probably been more understanding uh, uh, of its absence. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, I'm interested to see how uh, people's reactions are going to be around the absence of uh, of uh, 1989 on uh, Spotify. And uh, another interesting, exciting mm-hmm. thing that happened this week is Deezer and Stitcher. So uh, I I. I, this is, was one that I, I definitely would have never predicted. Uh, so Deezer has acquired Stitcher, uh, you know, adding uh, essentially 35,000 podcasts and radio programs uh, uh, to its, uh, 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 you know, catalog, essentially. You know, uh, Deezer said that uh, Stitcher will continue to exist, uh, uh, and but uh, from 2015, uh, they will uh, add essentially so, uh, in the search bar uh, the opportunity for people to search for uh, podcasts and radio programs as well as uh, on-demand music directly from Deezer. I mean, this is uh, really uh, revolutionary because it's the first time that we're seeing a serious play by a streaming uh, uh, on-demand streaming music service uh, uh, towards integrating radio programs and podcasts, which I think uh, uh, is uh, going to be the next uh, step, really, in in bringing uh, streaming music to the mainstream because people still want to hear uh, talk content uh, and curated content, uh, uh, radio programs, and the fact that they they would allow from next year to uh, listen to both uh, within the same software uh, that would be really really cool so uh, uh, Barbara how do you feel about it uh, uh, you know uh, would you have foreseen something like this happening this year and uh, uh, would you like to have the opportunity to listen to radio programs and uh, on-demand streaming music from the same uh, platform absolutely so absolutely not I have not foreseen this it is uh, a re- I think it is a really good move yeah it's really clever because it is um, yeah it it's very clever. It, it is really the same ecosystem, and and it is um, for me as a user, it would be uh, perfect. I am not a Deezer user. Deezer just started here. I still use, of course, uh, Spotify. But uh, this could be really interesting uh, for user to switch over. It really depends on the program. I mean, Stitcher is an American company. Yeah. Uh, they do not have uh, uh, very much uh, stuff from Germany or Europe, I guess. But uh, this is a very interesting model. And let's see who is the next uh, on this on this on this train. It's yeah. it's cool, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's really cool. I mean, uh, th- the one thing that I, I've sort of had at the back of my head, and it's a completely wild speculation from my part, but uh, is that when we've seen uh, stuff like the uh, Billy Bragg uh, commentaries on Spotify and we've seen other uh, sort of uh, type of talk-related content being pushed on Spotify, which was mostly, you know, artist-related, but that kind of made me think as to whether there could be a really interesting play for Spotify to uh, provide... Uh, you know, podcasters and, and, and people that work in radio with an additional outlet for their content uh, that could be perhaps monetized, uh, uh, maybe not at the same rates, but in a similar way to how music is being monetized on Spotify at the moment. Uh, so that kind of like got me thinking as to whether they would ever allow people to uh, upload uh, non-music content because, you know, f- in theory, that could be already be possible. You know, I could, in theory, go on TuneCore and add one of the podcasts as a music track and then it would eventually become available on Spotify. I don't know 
know, it will probably get taken down at some point. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm really curious to see whether there are alternative business models around monetizing talk content on music services uh, do, do you think that could uh, i mean it's total speculation but uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> do you think that could be an option absolutely and i think you really should try you have contacts to all these distributors you have a podcast you have a show just ask them and and i think as as long as you have an um ESRT code um everything can can be streamed or um, the interesting part here is uh, and back to germany is of course we have a lot of uh, podcasts from the national radio thing. Yeah. How, you know, I think it's very complicated to deal with this in terms of money, but it also in terms of uh, 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 geolocation things. And yeah. yeah, but it's great. A, a whole new world uh, it just popped up. Yeah, absolutely. Me. I mean, I mean that, that's the thing. Like, I think that the, the key issue around radio and uh, radio programming, uh, Stitcher, also companies like TuneIn and uh, streaming services, is the fact that uh, a lot of these, uh, you know, TuneIn, for example, monetizes uh, via advertising on, on, on its own app uh, in different ways. Uh, and I guess the, the, the key thing here is that uh, the, the podcasters or the radio programs themselves uh, have to have advertising on the shows in order to monetize it so like like i do you know when i have a, a sponsor on board i, I would have the sponsorship uh, uh, you know a segment uh, at the beginning and that would also sort of uh, percolate into into all the other services that are supporting it uh, uh, and sort of that that would be the key way of, of making money out of it unless the services themselves decide to start paying uh, uh, some uh, something out of their uh, advertising revenues or uh, something out of the subs subscription revenues uh, if you are generating significant uh, amount of, 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 of listeners on, on the platform so yeah, I mean, a lot of question marks around that, but I'm really excited. I would love to see, uh, to be able to, for example, have, a, you know, This Week in Tech, which is a two-hour show, and uh, sort of tell tell Deezer, look, I want to listen to half an hour, and then I want to listen to half an hour of music, and then another half hour of the show, and sort of you deal with it, and, and you do it for me. Uh, that would be amazing, I think, and it would be a really a big driver of, uh, of engagement. Uh, so I, um, I don't know if I mentioned it, actually, at the beginning of the show, but we are meant to have another guest today on. Uh, unfortunately, he was stuck on a plane because it was delayed he was on an inter intercontinental flight so I will definitely let him off uh, for, for that uh, and uh, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the Indian music market but I think we're going to skip that for this week and uh, uh, the next uh, 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 just a couple more stories left essentially to cover for today but uh, uh, actually first Barbara I wanted to ask you about uh, you were talking about the fact that you went to uh, the Music Tech Fest in Berlin and I, I went to the London one a couple of months back so uh, how was it how, how do you find it? I I think this uh, it was fantastic it was really great and I think these are the things we we need to do more in the future you know to bring back music and tech and not only talking about um I mean especially the conferences in Germany are very far away from these kind of concept of um, it's it's all about uh, you have been to in Germany to some conferences I guess oh yeah yeah and Lots. and and Lots. <laughs> and uh, but this approach uh, um, is new and this is great because it's really it's it's the makers are there the people who are doing music and they are and the spirit of collaboration people there was also a 25 hour hackathon not right. 24 because we had the time change <laughs> and, <Nice. laughs> and uh, um, it was not a hackathon as it as a, as a hackathon, it was more a uh, thing, you know, people who never did anything with, uh, with, with um, um, Arduinos or something, they got into it. And also on the other side, musicians. Um, yeah, it is really great. So I think we need more of these um, yeah. to disrupt uh, the making music thing. And uh, it was a really great start. It was very well, very short notice plan so yeah. we had uh, but still that it was three days amazing people and uh, yeah the team around uh, Andrew Dabba is is really good it's yeah it's just um, I think this is the f right way to do right now yeah. to disrupt the music future Exactly. I mean, it's uh, yeah. As you said, you know, it's it's an event that uh, perhaps in some of its, its iteration, come you know, it's organized. 
uh, a bit of the last minute compared to maybe some conferences that we go to that are, have been organized uh, sort of a year in advance. But it sort of adds to the uh, interest of the fact that there's all sorts of people uh, uh, turning up and, and showing uh, amazing ideas and amazing, th- amazing things that they're working on, work, works in progress, you know. Uh, not everything is a, the, the finished article, of course. And so, uh, yeah, I, th- I think there's a lot of value to that. Yeah, yeah, they are going uh, in three weeks. They are doing it in Paris, so it's a whole series. Yeah. They are doing such a such an amazing job to bring this technology to everyone uh, who is interested. And yeah, it was really big fun to be there to meet all the people. And I'm very much looking forward to work with them also uh, for future stuff. Absolutely, you know, it's it's it's, uh, it's an exciting event, and uh, the London one, uh, I was I was there for for a day, and uh, I really really enjoyed it. So um, uh, thanks for for your feedback on that. And uh, I want actually to uh, introduce uh, uh, Tidal uh, on the show. I wanted to uh, give a give you a, a brief uh, demo of the service uh, while we're here. Uh, Tidal launched officially yesterday in the US and in the UK. It's a new streaming service uh, that is based on uh, high quality audio uh, only. They have uh, CD quality uh, tracks. Uh, uh, you know, uh, or well over 10 million tracks uh, in uh, high quality audio. Uh, the service is based essentially on WIMP. Uh, WIMP is a service available in a few Scandinavian countries plus Germany and uh, Poland, I think. Uh, um, and uh, they decided to uh, attack the US and UK market uh, by launching a, a high definition a high definition app that will cost uh, much more than the standard streaming services you know a title is going to be uh, 19 pounds 99 per month in the UK and uh, $19.99 uh, per month in the US uh, um, so the service uh, looks like this it's a nice uh, neat interface uh, the first page uh, um, if you are uh, I'm, I'm going to talk it, talk you through it if you are listening to the audio version of the show but Essentially, uh, you are uh, introduced to a what's new page uh, once you, uh, you know, uh, log into the service. Uh, uh, on the top, uh, you find uh, some links to uh, um, playlists that you might like, uh, seasonal playlists, uh, latest albums uh, in sort of a scrolling top screen. Um, uh, you know, there's a trick or treat playlist, of course, now for Halloween. Uh, then the second part is, is the actual playlist section. Uh, and that uh, seems to feature things that uh, they picked out based on the genres that you specify once you, once you join the service so for example i've got a south by southwest 2015 playlist uh, there's a london jazz festival playlist so uh, some interesting things here and they're all curated by uh, the team at wimp slash tidal um, and then you got the album section of course some of the latest releases uh, uh, some of the key tracks uh, that are trending on the service uh, again based on uh, your uh, genres uh, i would imagine as i have uh, the foo fighters is number one so i think uh, they took uh, uh, that into account otherwise we'll probably have a very different list uh, then you have uh, you know different functions playlists uh, as uh, many other services you can uh, uh, choose a mood and then uh, all the playlists are curated by a uh, wimp uh, themselves uh, uh, tidal themselves of course they've had a few years uh, of uh, run-up in order to be able to do that uh, you have a, a genres uh, list uh, obviously uh, uh, you have a music collection uh, as you star music then it gets added and you can cash content obviously uh, another neat feature is the fact that you can search for content if you're listening to tracks so it's a shazam like feature you can literally just uh, tap uh, the mic uh, and then it will bring you to the track uh, on the service if uh, if you have it and so uh, you know i i feel like this is a really well designed service uh, and it had uh, um, I, I compared it to the quality on spotify which is 320 uh, kilobits per second this is a 44.1 kilohertz uh, at uh, 16 bit and you could actually hear the the, the difference uh, on, on re- relatively good speakers and uh, not audiophile speakers by any means but you could definitely feel like a, 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 a different level of clarity to the music whether this is a level of clarity that will persuade people to pay 20 pounds or 20 dollars a month uh, i am not sure that is the big caveat the second big caveat is the fact that uh, people pointed out that uh, the company has used a very strange marketing video uh, on their website, which is uh, 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 pretty sexist in the sense that uh, it's called five, uh. five Things uh, a Man Should Have. And there's like a sort of a madman type uh, 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 situation that has been described that, uh, uh, you know, and the list of five things a man should have. And the last thing is uh, the attention for quality. And uh, uh, obviously, you know, if your attention for uh, attention for quality means that you will have to use Tidal because you want to have the highest quality audio available. So that was the one thing that I sort of wasn't really wasn't on board on uh, about the service and put me off a little bit uh, but uh, the the platform itself works really well and it seems like it's a uh 
uh, it's a well thought out and well designed service. Uh, about Barbara, how do you feel? You know, Germany could be actually a good market. They haven't launched there, but WIMP is present there, and they have uh, the high quality service is available in Germany uh, for a similar price point. So, uh, you know, do you think that people care about quality there, uh, and and would they be prepared to pay for it? Absolutely. Uh, uh, we have many people who care for it. It is a niche market, of course. It will not take over the uh, top 10 or top, top 20 stuff. But uh, uh, people are really taking, you know, Braun is from Germany, right. the company. You know? So uh, there is a market here for this. Um, let's see how, but it has to be somehow localized. But uh, yeah, it's a nice idea, but um, it's not a nice idea that they had this uh, crazy... Uh, this video on I want to I need to check it out <laughs> yeah I mean uh, literally like uh, I, I don't really get uh, upset at things quite easily but this was was pretty bad because you know it's, it's just like you know essentially excluding the, the entire female population from as as potential users of their service which doesn't make any yeah. sense uh, no, I mean, no, of no, course I, you know, I understand that the probably the, the demographic research showed that probably men were more likely to own audiophile equipment uh, but that doesn't mean that you know they should just exclude the female population from from the user base so yeah uh, germany is very sensitive on this topic so they really should not do this yeah. over here yeah i mean i mean in the us i mean we've seen some of the latest debates there as well so it's definitely not a good time to make uh, to make a statement of that kind especially given all the <laughs> things that happen with microsoft and stuff so uh, yeah i mean uh, uh, something they should probably think about and and try and f and shoot a different advert for the service uh, if possible uh, and finally uh, i wanted to talk about uh, the european union so the european court of justice delivered an important ruling uh, stating that uh, embedding copyrighted videos on a third-party website does not constitute copyright infringement uh, so uh, you know this is something that I guess most of us took for granted but it was actually the legislation on this was uh, really unclear uh, and so uh, the uh, case was referred actually by a German court uh, to uh, the European Court of Justice uh, and uh, uh, you know they um, they ruled that embedding uh, is not copyright infringement and this will actually bind uh, uh, all uh, uh, EU territories essentially because the European Court of Justice is the highest uh, court uh, and it even supersedes the Supreme Court here in the UK so uh, you know uh, I think this uh, makes sense uh, the funny thing is that the case that uh, uh, came uh, uh, to the fore on this was not a media related case in any in any way it was essentially uh, it was a, a plumbing company or a water it was a company called Best Water uh, and uh, 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 essentially uh, the video that they produced uh, had been embedded uh, by uh, two people that worked as agents uh, for a competitor uh, and so Best Water essentially claimed copyright infringement because they didn't want those people to embed the video onto the web their website but the court found that because the video was on YouTube uh, you know uh, there were there were two essentially two uh, uh, things that would have led to a copyright infringement. The first one uh, was an alteration of the video, so if they'd taken the video and changed it that, that would have constituted copyright infringement perhaps uh, uh, and um, the second one is communication to a new public but because the video was on youtube it was already available for the whole world and so the, the court found that there was no communication to a new public because everybody could already see it so uh, i mean a common sense decision it makes a lot of sense but it's still great to see something like this sort of be established right i haven't heard of this case at all i must admit but it's an, it's a very interesting story so right now we the the the, the, the things we are really worried about is the net net neutrality thing yeah uh, so, so maybe this is why I haven't noticed uh, uh, this case. If you could, very interesting story. So, but I'm sorry, I can't say anything. No, about absolutely this. not. It's, it's just I, I find it. I mean, it, it's it doesn't change anything because I think most of us already assumed that we weren't infringing copyright if we embedded a video on YouTube but it's also mm. good to know that uh, the court ruled in this way because if they ruled the other way they would have created a massive <laughs> issue for the internet everyone <laughs> yeah they would have uh, created a massive issues for for the internet in Europe and uh, you know uh, starting with news organizations that are embedding videos constantly constantly right now and uh, uh, aside from that I think the only thing to mention that's left is uh, is there anything left to mention um, oh uh, Jawbone has launched a new app called Drop, uh, which will enable users to create, generate a playlist catered to their tastes uh, with just one click. It's uh, a fairly basic functionality, and it's based on uh, Playground FM, a, a music startup acquired by 
job on in 2013 that is now offline so that's uh, uh, the last uh, tidbit of news for this week uh, and uh, uh, Barbara I will let you uh, get uh, to the conference that you need to get to uh, as well but uh, before you go anything that you'd like to plug or anything you've been working on that you'd like uh, our listeners to uh, be aware of right now um, right now I'm really recovering from the last weeks so was uh, very much to do and the upcoming week is going to be very, very stressful yeah. um, but if you're in Paris in three weeks go to the Music Tech Fest or just check out the musictechfest.org website they are also planning to go to uh, New York already uh, this uh, year and um, yeah I'm looking forward to see you uh, next week at the, in Dublin yeah absolutely me too um, yeah it should be fun there's yeah. lots of people there so uh, it's uh, turning out to be quite a good conference to go to for uh, music folks too and again uh, nice. Beam, Beam Air this week uh, you can follow up uh, on, on what I'm doing there uh, this week I'm doing a keynote interview with uh, Benji Rogers at Pledge uh, tomorrow afternoon so that should be really fun and uh, uh, aside from that uh, I think that's all for this week uh, thanks so much for uh, joining me Barbara and uh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, unfortunately, uh, my third guest uh, could not join us uh, unless we get to record a segment later, in which case I will intersperse it in, in, in the show. But I doubt that's going to happen, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, thanks so much for listening this week. Uh, you can check out digitalmusictrans.com for more information. If you'd like to get in touch, uh, the handle is at digimusictrans. Uh, and uh, uh, the handle for Barbara is at barbnerdy. If you are on the audio show and you cannot see the, uh, <laughs> the uh, handle on the screen. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic week and until uh, next time